A driving thirst for knowledge is the forerunner of wisdom. Knowledge is a state that all organic life possesses. Wisdom is the reward of spirit, gain in the search for knowledge. So we come to the heart of the people, the belief based upon eternity and not upon social needs or pressures. The witches believe, then, it's concerned with wisdom. Our true name, then, is the wise people, and wisdom is our aim. Robert Cochran. Well, first of all, this is an incredible book, um, one of which is, I think, very dense in terms of gnosis. Um, it, it is really very rich. Um, and, you know, I'm sure I have um, lots of questions, but I'm sure that we're not going to, again, we're not going to go through the whole book because it's almost impossible. We're There's just going, a lot of it. <laughs> yeah, so we're going to just go to little t tidbits that I think that are very, very wonderful. Wonderful book uh, from um, you, and it's an uh, Anathema um, and Shani uh, publication. Very impressive uh, in terms of quality. It's absolutely a work of art, I think, isn't it? I think it, it is <laughs> stunningly beautiful. I, I still cannot believe it when I look at it. It's true, yeah. And um, it has this beautiful piece of art, uh, La Fleur Etrange, which is absolutely amazing. Then the quality of the binding uh, of this and the book production is absolutely stunning uh anathema publishing which is curiously enough it's in canada isn't it it's a yes, canadian yes, it publisher is. yes um so uh i want to start this and have the 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 book is called uh, crafting the art of tradition uh, i know that you have done a couple of interviews before and i don't want to go into the same um, you know, uh, questions. So I'm going to try to be a little bit more <laughs> creative. Mm. Um, uh, this is a very good opportunity for us to ask you directly because we have heard you before in interviews. Um, we sometimes talk about it, um, but I want you to resume, how would you resume um, the history of... of uh, uh, just a glimpse of the history of the Tubal Cain from the beginning until now. Oh, my goodness. That just takes us back quite a way, um, <laughs> obviously, to, to Robert Cochran, <laughs> to the actual founder of the name itself. Uh, the tradition itself is believed to be considerably older than that, um, with several, several different formations through time and space with different people. Um, taking the helm as it were. But he, as John always said, was the first to take it out there. So it is, in the public sense, the first of its beginnings. Um, Robert Cochran was there. And he decided um, at a time when, I suppose you could call it the swinging 60s, when everyone was interested in the shock of the new and everything that was um, occult was the in vogue. And he thought that this would be an ideal time to become interested in something that he had to offer them, um, something deeper than what appeared to be uh, normally available out there in the public domain on TV and media and in books. So he thought, well, you know, this is this is an ideal time. It's everything's in the hopeful move. Mm -hmm. Everything's moving forward. It was a time of optimism and great, great times. But... Unfortunately, it didn't work out that way at all. Um, but he he persevered with it and pushed it forward. And then his own tragic life um, meant that he didn't actually hold it too long out there. But what he did leave was a tremendous um, legacy in the form of inspirational works that have continued to feed all of us that have lived on through it, his tradition since. And Evan John Jones um, was his helmsman that took it over for 30, 40 years after Robert Cochran died. And he held it in care. He was a caretaker and guardian of that tradition and developed it by working it, which is something that he and Roy had only just be, begun to do. 
in the, the meta time they had together. So, of course, being able to spend so much more time working it as a lived tradition each and every day, he was able to get um, completely different understandings and a much more experience about the way things actually work on the ground rather than being in the planning stages and operational stages um, and moving with the times as well because mm -hmm. as, as Robert Cochran was very keen to say, things have to move on, they have to change, they have to become relevant to their own era. And the 80s and 90s were very, very different to the 60s, as our decade now is very different to that. Everything moves on, paradigms change, moods change, politics change. And although the tradition remains the same, it needs to be reinterpreted through the lens of the perspective of the people that are witnessing it in their own time. In other words, make it relevant to them and Absolutely. their experiences, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, now, he draw, Roy, that is, draw a lot of, um, and you can see that in the in the texts and, you know, all of that. He draw a lot of influence from some of the, um, some authors, right, and some relevant books. Can you talk about a little bit about that, what influences in his work? Mm, the influences, um in his time, of course, in the 60s, publications on the occult were very, very small, but um, and very few and very difficult to get hold of. But I think the books that influenced him the most were not actual books on the occult at all, um, but books on folklore, books on um, more arcane traditions, such as um, T.C. Lethbridge's was one on the witches that he was particularly keen on. But he was also very keen on looking into anthropology. And I think the folklore books that were around at the time were very, very, again, very difficult to get hold of. And although I don't have the titles of those books that were influencing him, they are things that um, John and I spoke of many times. That's Evan John Jones. Mm -hmm. And he would say that, you know, he both of them, had access, very little access to books. Mostly it was what was given to them um, in information and what they, they actually learned through their contacts um, on the other side, if you like, the, the things that you work with, the spirits um, that teach you um, the real nooks and crannies of any tradition. Mm -hmm. um, so the books that influenced him were very, very few. Mm -hmm. Just a mere handful, and one of those was definitely T.C. Lethbridge's, um, because his um, whole perspective on Diana, the huntress, and the 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 lady, the pale-faced lady, the le pale Leucothea, the wonderful white goddess herself, as well as the black goddess, all of these things come from a classical history, but he was using them to take out there, don't forget, they were not his own terms that he would use for his own tradition. Hmm. These books allowed him a medium of expression. They they are what allowed him to use a language of folklore and classical history through which to express his own tradition that he was oath bound not to reveal. Mm -hmm. um, so it gave him that, that latitude, if you like, to, to actually be able to say, well, look, I can say it's like this, because I'm not saying it is this, I'm saying it's like that. <laughs> and so he was very, very clever. He also used nursery rhymes and many other things that were available um, in that period of time in the 60s, um, which at that time was taking a great interest in folkloric history and literature. Um, there's been much more written since, but at that time there was, as I say, not very much available. You just mentioned it, that, uh, you know, most of the things and some of, some things actually are almost like remembered, right, through the work that you do with the other side, as you said. He actually says here um, in the book um, that... Um, He's talking about a great deal of tradition, uh, traditional right has been lost, he said. Um, but it will be recovered again one day, since things and thoughts alike do not die, they only change. And then he goes further and says, it is never fully forgotten and never fully remembered. 
uh, how so is is the process of remembering um the experience of the rights and the contact with the other side it is it is that completely and um, the process of anamnesis is is the re-remembering of the soul's journey before um, because one of the main tenets of our tradition is that we are returned home again and back to our own people with um, the same understanding of, of that journey. And as we move along through our lives together, we remember all that we did know before that we um, tend to forget in the leth as we pass over. Mm-hmm. And we have to re-remember that as quickly as possible because if you take most of your life to remember it, you're not going to leave very much to progress and evolve right. to advance you the next time round. Right. And hopefully um, you remember very quickly and you remember things much more quickly if you have people around you that are able to guide you. And by finding those people early enough in life to bring you together to actually present a tradition in which you can live fully each and every day, the experience that that will resonate um, and generate within you the capabilities of reaching through to the others on the other side as a combined, more powerful unit because there are more of you. Right. The the um, feedback, if you like, is so much stronger and such more more positive. And again, because people uh, work in different ways, the fact that you come together allows the different strengths and qualities that each person has to feed into a whole so that there is a greater chance of, if you like, contacting even more because each person will have memories of different things at different times. So putting these skills factors together, if you like, being able to draw upon them as individuals and a collective too, um, it it really does spur on that growth, that understanding, that remembering. And again, you feed that back into how you're living and that then feeds back into how you work. So each of it will bounce off back forth from the other, pushing you ever forward in a continual spiraling loop. And that is how we remember by half through actually living the work and half through um, mediating it. Would you think that Roy right now, if he was alive, um, would be amazed by how much he was remembered? Probably, yes, I'm sure he would be. (laughs) I don't think he would have ever expected to be. It was not, um, he did not have the ego that's been often ascribed to him. He had um, a tenacity of spirit, a willful nature that could be prone to, um, obviously, um, unsettling mannerisms. But that is obviously generally the mark of a true genius. But Mm -hmm. it's also the the mark of a frustrated person who is unable to fully express all that they know and feel in the time that they always feel pressured and limited to, to, uh, you know, to share. Mm -hmm. But he and himself knew that, like all of us, are unimportant. It's the work and the legacy that we leave for others to follow that is important. And he himself was the first to say that, you know, we're all nothing. Um, it's it's what we do that's important and that will be left for others. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so I suppose the fact that he has been iconicized, he would find quite amusing, I think. <laughs> Now, only in the preface, I have to say, only in the preface, this book is full of incredible um, information. Um, just by reading the preface is just <laughs> very enlightening. Um, and there are certain uh, quotes um, which are very, it's very interesting. Uh, one of them I'm going to read, it says, A driving thirst for knowledge is the forerunner of wisdom. Knowledge is the state that all organic life possesses. Wisdom is the reward of spirit gained in the search for knowledge. He goes on and on, and he does work, um, he does talk about uh, or mentions the word which in this particular um, piece. He says, um, so we come to the heart of the people, 
a belief based upon eternity and not on uh, and not upon social needs or pressures the which belief then is con it's concerned with wisdom our true name then author's emphasis so this is your emphasis is the wise people and wisdom is our aim he used uh, this this word here and, and he used it between uh, single commas you mentioned this uh, as being very rare that he never talked about um, or called witches uh, or used this name um, and what was the intent of of using this name you think you you were talking about the 60s the people at the time do you think that this was a popular word at the time because of Gerald Gardner and he did that mention that because he wanted to be heard um and understood or do you think that it was something else probably both um mm. i mean he was obviously very much aware that the word had reintroduced itself into the culture and period of that time, right. his time. But he was also very, very much aware um, that centuries before, that word had been often used to describe um, what he would consider his people. And over centuries, those people have been various, as he names them there, the green gowns, the ladies, the 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 wood folk, the, um, mm -hmm. the forest folk there were just general folk people with their own folk folklore and they were charmers they were guilds people and crafters and all of these people throughout time particularly the with relevance to the last four five hundred years mm -hmm. have been named witches by others which is the reason and purpose he put them in inverted commas there to emphasize it isn't a name <clears throat> by which we ourselves use for each other. Mm -hmm. And he makes that clear as well. He says, we don't use this word for ourselves. It's what others call us. Right. It's what others have named us that don't fully understand what their work is about and what their beliefs are about. And I suppose in many respects, um, what recent academics have come to the conclusion of is that it is a better named, a popular religion. It's a folk religion in that it is the adopted religion that they are practiced under, that the tradition sits under, but it has its own beliefs that um, that encompasses. So it changes the, the natural religion of the land that they sit in, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of the people. Um, so therefore, folk religion, folk um, law is what informs that tradition, um, which is often very different to the practices and beliefs of a witch who is a witch and who would happily call themselves that mm -hmm. in in historically and in modern terms because of course that that um, understanding has changed as, as things do in time right um, but even in modern understanding it wouldn't be a word that we would necessarily apply to ourselves mm -hmm. though we don't discount the use of witchcraft within our work we are not witches per se mm-hmm mm-hmm and he was trying to get that point across at that time. Right, right. Now, at the time, um, and, you know, Gardner was a contemporary. Um, it was very interesting because, uh, and to see this, and the book goes really into it in one of the chapters. Um, did Roy consider what he was doing pagan? or even consider the neo-pagan term of the word? Because Gardner did. Gardner very much did. Um, he would not consider it to be neo-pagan, but he would possibly consider it to be pagan in the heathen sense of the word. In the Again, the natural religions of uh, northern peoples. Um, but it's, again, in the way that it has developed in its own sense as a popular religion amongst people through the last four or five hundred years, which will have changed from the way that the Germanic and Scandinavian peoples will have brought their religion to this country in the 6th to the 11th centuries. Right. What they brought would have been a very different and purer form of religion, um, of paganism and heathenism. Obviously, by the 18th and 19th centuries, that had changed quite dramatically in its understanding and practice. 
even by people who were following it. Um, and of course, it can only be followed as a popular religion in that it has become Christianized in its sense. And it has also got other um, other influences, other Gnostic influences and um, occult in- influences mm-hmm. that, that come from a, a diverse diversity of, of um, places. And so therefore, cumulatively and collectively, that is an expression of different heathenisms, paganisms, occultisms that are very different from a neo-pagan um, understanding of it and adoption of something from the past mm-hmm. um, and reapplied in the modern world. It, it's, it's quite a different thing. It's very interesting because, um, and, and I'm not saying this because uh, I'm an Alexandrian, but it really, <laughs> the more and more I hear um, what Roy did and, and what you have done and what uh, Evan had done as well, uh, bringing all of this, and it really does reminds me um, what Alex did for Wicca at the time. He, he dared to include a, a, a lot of other things that were not there originally, and he changed it um, dramatically uh, to the point that uh, it was called, or it is called, uh, a different tradition. But it really is very... I, I find it very, um, you know, the way, not the, you know, what it is, but the way that the genesis of it, it is, it's quite interesting to see. It is. I agree. I agree very much on that. I think um, Alex recognized that there needs to be a cultural input in something to give it a grounding, to give it a historical connection, to make that something that you can take forward. If you have something without that history, um, without that emphasis in the past, without some form of ancestry, you you have nowhere to go with it. How would you define uh, truth within the practices of the clan? Um, Truth is the, the most supreme virtue of all in that it represents the um, forces of the universe that are beyond our control, which we, is the main thing we seek to understand. To understand our place in that universe, we have to understand what it is in truth. We have to understand who we are in truth and what we desire and what we need in truth. And therefore we can separate what we need to move forward whilst hopefully satisfying the desires too. Um, But by understanding what is really needful in truth, we will not err into um, distraction. We won't won't fall by, excuse me, um, into the lie, as it were. The word will stay pure, the work will stay pure, the intent will stay pure because it's done in truth. That is, we won't negate our oaths to each other, to the old ones, to our ancestors, to our descendants who will inherit the legacy we leave for them as we have done for our forebears. So the truth is a very important link along the whole of that chain from one um, generation to several, to the the gods, to the spirits in between, to, to everything. The universe is constantly in flux to fate that overruns all of that. All of that is truth, everything. There is nothing that stands outside of truth except the lie. And even that um, is not entirely without. Um, it still has its its force within because it's an illusion of truth. It's a reflection of. Um, so therefore, we have to understand what truth is to avoid making those errors of judgment that take us away from the path of evolution of and course, progress. Yeah. Yes, of progress, yeah. Now, looking at um, the origins of, uh, of Wicca um, with Gerald, do you recognize um, any uh, distinct influences that, that forged both uh, Wicca and with Gerald and the clan practices with Roy? Um, I would have to say not really. They come from very, very different um, points and perspectives and even um, needs. The the driving force that um, fed into Wicca 
um, was very much um, a romantic movement, um, a literary movement um, in the late 1700s, where paganism, the Arcadia, as a great movement in nostalgia was being, uh, it was massive resurgence in these things and interest. And it led people to have an idealized understanding of the past. It was very, very much based on nostalgia. Um, whereas I think Roy's and and John's works that led into the outward perspective of the religion, if you like, and the practice and the traditions of it came from something much more deep rooted, much more earthy in, amongst the people itself as a naturally evolving thing. It wasn't something that was created and imposed as um, a bubble in itself, as it were. It was something that was naturally there and that was being worked and that was being um, moved in its own um, gravitational force, if you like, within the universe. It wasn't created in, in, a, in the same sense. I would say that possibly the only th way I might link them together is by saying that they could have been the product of a need to re-establish culture, any form of culture that was feeling lost or abandoned in that time. It could be the reason why Roy wanted to emerge it out into the public. It could be the reason why uh, Crowley and Gardner and others actually formulated this, the, the Wicca, to represent a sense of culture they felt was lacking and that in its sense is possibly the only way I could link them that they all recognized there was out there in the public a lack of a meaningful culture. One of the things that I'm very interested in is um, not going into detail of course but I'm really interested in uh, in this because you know then again um, training uh, it was it is still very important within um, Alexandrian uh, tradition. Uh, you talk about training within Wicca, that it's modular, it's specific to the advance of the initiate uh, through the degrees, still is, um, and it has an aim, which is ultimately for that initiate to hive off and form his own group and teach again. Um, how does this work in traditional craft? Um, well, in, in traditional craft, it is um, very different, again, in the respect that people are not trained up with the aim of leaving and, and starting somewhere else um, to perpetuate or extend it. Um, people come back to their home, to their hearth, as family, and the family stays and grows. Um, it's it's um, People are guided towards understanding and experiencing their own journey within that. Um, we're all pilgrims together, but we each have our own separate journey as well. And the skills that we each have are shared to assist others in areas they may not be so strong in. Mm -hmm. We're not all trained to do the same thing or understand it in the same way. We each have our own understandings of things, um, our own way of doing things, as long as we each share an understanding of the core, um, then there is a great deal of latitude for understanding and some very discussions, <laughs> interesting discussions <laughs> ensue from that. We don't all share the same politics, for instance, but ultimately those politics serve the same goal. Right. So right. Um, we each have um, a mediation in spirit and in the oaths that we share with each other that allow us to actually balance everything out so that we can move forward collectively but as individuals. And although we're moving forward in life, that journey doesn't end even in death because then we're brought back to, to continue the family. So it, it's, it's never, it doesn't really end or shift or change in that respect in the same way that Wicca does. We're always together as one unit, one family for life. If you know, fate allows that. Since the beginning, I mean, and really since the beginning, uh, uh, 
Wicca and uh, was was always formulated this way, and I don't know. Um, uh, there's a couple of theories about this. You know, I'm talking about the threefold law. Um, some people think that the threefold law is there because it is a safety device. Some others think differently. You say, and I quote, to almost all of those who follow a pathway within traditional craft, healing and cursing are accepted as one in truth. How is ethics viewed in traditional craft, do you think? The ethics must always come down to truth. Um, if, um, you know, for one example of healing and cursing, if you are trying to um, sponsor somebody to have some form of, of advantage over another, you're disadvantaging that person. So by bringing a blessing upon one, you're cursing another. It is a double-edged sword. It can not only have one one shade of perspective. Everything has a double role. There is, there's, there's no getting away from that. You can't move forward without something else affecting something else. So that is the truth, and the ethic must always lie in that. So it's about responsibility. So it's about actually understanding the truthfulness of those actions in the wideness and the you know the absolute sense of where it will all go and in as much as you can possibly and logically work out as a human and therefore if you still wish to move ahead with either a blessing or a cursing it is with that understanding it is with that foresight and hindsight because you learn from the past there's always that foresight and hindsight that are very important in planning that procedure and also, there is the understanding that being in fate, if you are in that truthful path in fate, it will work through almost by itself anyway. You will oftentimes have very little to do if you're working in the rightness of things because you are making those decisions, those what you might call ethical decisions, um, to make sure that everything is in play as it needs to be. And by understanding what is needful and what is truthful, you're avoiding as many of the unpleasant repercussions as you can avoid in life. And it is obviously very difficult because everything you do will have a, an effect, even if you're doing something what you might perceive to be good, and that is only a matter of perception, of course. Something will occur as a result of that that isn't. So it's it's being responsible for those extremes. It's about understanding those extremes. Those are the ethics that we try to grasp and, and teach and move with. Roy said, a witch is born, but if made, tears will be shed. What do you think that he meant by this? Well, um, I think that he meant that, of course, if you will force a square peg into a round hole, <laughs> then it's going to be very uncomfortable, <laughs> because you cannot force what isn't there. A person can assume they can presume, they can wear a mask, they can pretend. And there are some very, very good illusionists out there, some very, very good charlatans and carpetbaggers. And there will be tears, not just for them, but for everyone around them. It's You have a natural proclivity, a natural gift, or you don't. And that was his, that was his maxim, that's it. It's, it's there or it isn't. And you can't make one, you can only pretend to be one. If you've had to... Make it, you faked it. You talk about distractions as well. We are, mm -hmm. You already mentioned that um, in the beginning. Um, what are the most permanent distractions that can prevent true practice? Oh, now life is in itself one massive distraction. Um, but I would say um, the propensity, the natural propensity that humanity has in either being selfish or thinking that they can make a difference. Um, and if you think that you can make a difference, then oftentimes you will allow your ego to presume that you will make a difference rather than always working on the assumption that you probably won't, but you should still try. That is another ethic. You must always, always do it, even if you feel it isn't going anywhere. 
Um, if you feel that there is the need to do something, you do it. You fulfill that need. And if it goes somewhere, then that's fantastic. If not, you discharge that duty um, and that need for that work. But there, there it is, you see, you, you have that distraction of, of wondering, is this going to work? If I can make it work, and then people fall into the trap of ego. Ego is an enormous distraction. In our modern times, the, um, the luxurious consumerism is a distraction. It's a lure, but it should be something that is enjoyed and appreciated and loved um, because we are creatures of sensitivity and our senses are what make us feel alive. We need to um, satisfy those senses, but not to the extreme that we forget our, our purpose is to evolve as human beings as well, not to be in status quo, not to corrupt by being in the status quo, um, because being in stasis, of course, is a destructive process. It, it in itself doesn't allow something to flourish. And to flourish, you have to have that stimulus um, that you can still see, that you don't lose sight of. It mustn't be drowned by the indulgence of the self and the ego. So by it, being able to keep those in check, but by uh, you know being aware they are there, they need attention, uh, you need to still move on. So it's understanding again what distraction is and working through it, rather that you can't deny it or you know, you'd be a monk and we're not here to be monks. We're here to be human beings in a life, real life, having real pleasures. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Otherwise, why are we here? Right. You, know? <laughs> right. You've got to, you, you have to have life. How would you describe, um, again, very uh, briefly, um, the myth of creation? The myth of creation is very well, it's a very, very beautiful thing. In the way that John always described it is slightly different to how um, Robert Cochran described it. But ultimately, they come to the same thing. Creation comes from desire, which is in itself a Gnostic um, terminology, in that something is driven by a purity of of ideal, because without ideals, we are all nothing. And the ideal allows um, the multiplicity of form. It allows the development of, of the self to be pulled out of itself so that it generates more of the self in that it then disseminates into other things that manifest. So this pulling out of the soul, out of the desire, out of the need to be, allows for creation from a human being to a sun, to a moon, to a star, to a universe. And within all of that creation, it starts with the seed of the desire, the need to be, the need to expand and evolve, which again comes back to our entire premise of truth, of why things are there. The purpose of things being there is, is to be, to understand what life is. And if you don't question how to be, how to be alive, there is no creativity, there is no moving forward. So everything comes back to that point of creation. Each moment we are alive, we are hopefully creating something that is good for ourselves, good for the next generation, good for life, good for the universe and allows everything to continue to grow, to be. There was someone once that told you that we are here, all of us, because we failed. Yes. Why would this be so? If um, eventually, if we become evolved enough, there is no need to return. There is no need to be in a manifest form. We can continue to be teachers and spirits and spiritual entities that exist in a different level of being, in a different place, in a different time. Hence, the out of time, out of place, as one of our as sayings, um, so that we can actually, hopefully, evolve again in spirit. And ultimately, it's a continual process of evolution. And the manifest form here is the greatest lessons because the greatest lessons are learned in life. 
the physical lessons of understanding being and who we are and how to how to move forward is only can only be learned in the physical form so to constantly be reborn in that form means there are still things needful to learn to understand it is only when we've accomplished those things that we no longer need to be here again we will not be returned we can move on Penned by Roy Bowers, um, there is this beautiful, um, you call it prayer, uh, magnificent prayer, you say, Um, and it's just beautiful. Um, I'm going to read it uh, just to, you know, and then I'm going to ask you the question. Thou who created the heavens and the earth, order from chaos and time from eternity, I pray to thee. Thou who listen to our deepest voice, Thou who inspires our inherited wisdom, Thou who shines forth the pleasing light, and who protect us from the beneful might of the destroyer, I pray Thee always to grant me the inner voice that will speak of spiritual things, and let love always be our guiding light. In the name of the Old Father, the Dark and Bright Twins, and the Three Mothers, whose spirit moves all. Um, What concepts intrinsic to your mythos um, are expressed in this prayer, you think? Apotheosis. Hmm. It is the... The building of the mask upon the self of the God form within. It is the fire in the head. It is bringing out of of all that is meeting, the point of meeting, the soul between and the mind soul and the group soul and the anima mundi, the world soul. It is to pull all of that together and to be the God within that all human beings are. Everyone has that spark. We are all gods within. And it is to be aware of that, to be mindful of it, and to invoke the ancestral protectors um, of our kind to always be with us, to be again aware and thankful of them, and to know that they are always with us. So in itself, it is a prayer, but it's also an invocation, and it's also a promise to them um, of reciprocity, that we will always be faithful to them, always recognize them, and they will always be with us as we wear that mask in realization of that. As we build that, that God face upon ourselves, we know it is not just ours, but it's theirs as well. It's belonged to them in times past, and it will belong to others in times to come. So it's, it's a link through all of those things, really, and a reminder of, of that spark within and, and just how bright it is and how needful it is to remember it. Now, some of the opinion that this book is almost a book of revelations for them because it did transform their lives um, when they read it and brought from them forth um, different things from different people, right? So um, I've spoke to a couple of people who read the book and they said different things. And it's, it's very interesting to see how this book... It is really truly magical because it can it can it can actually bring forth all of these desires and all of these things and make people think, um, which is you know wonderful um, in itself. You know, let alone the poetic way that you write. Um, one of the things that you say here, and it's about the primal law. You say, "How wonderful is this gift of grace." Some are born knowing, and others die seeking. Some are born certain, and others die perplexed. Some are simply aware, and others have yet to become. We each perceive best that view which accommodates our present. The future is spun from the weave of that discovery. What do you think that we seek, really? What do you think that it is in the innermost 
um, depths of the human soul. To, to know thyself. Always, I think, that has been the uttermost um, spoken gesture um, in every culture, in every time, to know the self. And so to know thyself in every every culture, in every magical precept, is is what drives us. It's what we all seek to know. It's what we all seek to be. Because without knowing who we are, how can we know anything? Because we have no place anywhere until we know who we are properly and truly. And the fact that some of us, because of anamnesis, because of that process of rem remembering, we know who we are. Others die without ever understanding that. Um, and so there is this constant process, this push towards discovering that fact. And the way m to move forward, to weave all of that together into a purposeful action is to strive towards that. So even if you don't achieve it yet, you will. Um, and so it's to move toward that, to have that goal there is hope. Um, again, there is that light of hope for everyone. It is to hold to that, even if we cannot always understand it. It is to still hold it in heart and mind so that it is there as a beacon. Because without that beacon, we will be lost. Um, so even if everything isn't clear, it will become so. Mm -hmm.